Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. I'd like to remind everyone that these recordings will be posted online to our BYU Family History Library website and also to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. Um, feel free to let your friends and family know about them so we can help everyone get to know a little bit more about family history. Today we're excited to hear from James Tanner um, who will be speaking on Digging Deeper into Maps and Mapping Programs. My name is Braden Knutson. and I will be your host for this webinar. Um, James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Feel free to use our chat box for any questions during the presentation. We will get to them at the end. Thanks. We'll turn the time over to James. Hi, this is James Tanner. I'd like to welcome you here to Digging Deeper into Maps and Mapping Programs. This is part of a webinar series that's being uh, hosted by the Brigham Young University Family History Library, which is part of the BYU a Harold B. Lee Library, the very large library at the center campus. And uh, these uh, videos are being um, uploaded uh, as uh, videos to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and also on the BYU Family History Library webpage. So you can watch all of their preceding videos. We now have over 150 of those videos online and we invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you. Um, and talking about maps, maps are uh, eminently, preemptively important for genealogical research. Um, first of all, we need to understand a lot about the maps themselves. Um, you think it's quite simple. It's something you find in your club box, fold it up, throw it in the club box, uh, look at it when you figure out if you can't find it on your uh, on your a smartphone or a computer, uh, but there are really a lot more details and convent and uh, complex than uh, than they would seem to be at first, and they also convey a lot more information than you would expect, uh, depending on the type of map and the type of, of uh, information that's represented. Uh, the definition. Definition of a map is a diagrammatic representation of an area of land or sea showing physical features, cities, roads, and etc. So when we have anything that represents uh, the surface of the earth from a, a drawing on the back of a, an envelope or piece of paper showing someone how to get to your house or uh, a uh, satellite view of the earth, all of these things are uh, included in the in the definition of maps. Um, one of the most in, one of the most important things to understand about uh, doing genealogical research is that genealogically important records are created at or near the time of an event by someone who witnessed the event or had a duty to record the information. Uh, if you analyze this uh, definition of records, you'll see that uh, there's something, uh, there's a distance factor here. It's called they're created near, the t near an event. So at the time or near the time of an event and by someone who actually witnessed it. So what happens here is that records, uh, as they are created, have a tendency to cluster around uh, the location that the events occur, where the events occurred. So, for example, if you were, uh, if, if your ancestor was born in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, then the records would be congregated primarily about his birth in that area of Pennsylvania. Now, there are some exceptions, and that what makes genealogical research interesting 
because uh, records like people have a tendency to move around and it may be difficult to locate the records even after you have uh, identified the place. Uh, what is more important though is that the person in, in distinguishing between people you really need to focus on the place where the events occurred. Um, the, the theme here and what to remember is that records are associated with locations. Uh, if you aren't aware of the location, then you have difficulty locating the records. Uh, it's very easy, for example, uh, to find a record with someone with a, with a tremendously uh, unique name. Uh, by the way, there are very few unique names. But when you have someone with a very different name, it, uh, it makes that life easier. But unfortunately, most of my ancestors, and I suspect that many of yours, had very common names. Um, I did a search recently on English in England on uh, records of one of my families, the Parkinson family, and found uh, many hundreds of thousands of Parkinson's had lived in England. Uh, if, if you have an ancestor like I do, whose names are James or Charles or Thomas Parkinson, uh, finding which of the many Parkinson's there are uh, can be an overwhelming task. Uh, so what we do is we associate our research with a location and a specific event that occurred in, a, uh, in an ancestor's life. And that becomes like an anchor point where you can begin to do research with some degree of, uh, of reliability. As I found over the years, um, most of the dead end, or what we call brick walls in, uh, in genealogical parlance, come from looking in the wrong place. Um, I don't take that lightly because in examining um, the, the huge number of people over the years asking questions about their dead end or the ancestor that they couldn't find, I would, 80% is my ballpark figure, but I would guess that it's even higher than that of the number of play, times that we find that the person is really looking in the wrong place. And that's where it comes down to being unable to find the ancestor specifically. Um, kind of an example that happened today, I have uh, a, a number of lines that go back to England. And um, one of the things that I find as I find these people re uh, recorded on uh, the large online family tree, such as FamilySearch.org's family tree or uh, Ancestry, is that often uh, members of the family are shown uh, simply because a child was uh, identified with parents of the, of the same name at about the same time. And they turn up with families where each of the children have five or six different children born in five or six different counties. Now, physically, uh, humanly, that's possible. Uh, practically, especially in England, that's very difficult. Uh, there's a couple of facts that you should probably know about England, and that is that the Industrial Revolution uh, didn't begin in earnest until mid-1800s. Uh, the ballpark figure there is about 1830. And so early dates in England, uh, studies have shown that uh, number of, that the people who lived in the area uh, married, uh, got, died, and were born within six miles on the average of the place where, where any of those events occurred. Uh, so when you're trying to find people as you go back in time, uh, you'll find that the, uh, the, the geographic areas where the records might, be, uh, might have originated uh, begin to shrink in direct proportion to, the, to as you go back uh, into, uh, into historical times. So uh, basically, if I find somebody who was, uh, who supposedly got married to someone who lived uh, 150 miles away in England, uh, I can almost automatically reject that uh, uh, evidence association or whatever you want to call it, uh, because it is not uh, closely associated with the location where all of these people lived. As a matter of fact, I have uh, several lines stemming back from uh, one of my family's 
is the Parkinson family. And as I go back on the Parkinson family and all of their uh, predecessors, uh, the different families, the Newtons and the Bryans and the um, and uh, chattels and all of these other families that uh, were the ancestors of the Parkinson's, I find that all of them, every last one of the people lived within an area of about 10 to 15 uh, miles. If so, if you drew a, a circle around uh, a point where you found a, a, a positive record, you would find everyone else who was uh, related to this family within that 10 to 15 mile circle. So it's just, it's an interesting uh, thing to contemplate. Now, uh, life is built on exceptions, of course, and it's very possible that people can travel. The, um, uh, the, the situation that we find ourselves in today is far different than it would have been in the early 1800s. Uh, back then, before there were trains, planes, and all of the other kind of uh, fast conveyances, uh, people would take a tremendous amount of time and effort just to move 10 or 15 miles. In today's world, of course, people can, can meet and, and become engaged and get married uh, across continents. So uh, we, we do have to take into consideration that uh, the more modern the time, the more, the more uh, latitude there is in, in uh, prescribing the area in which something might have happened. Um, so what do, do maps do for genealogists? First of all, uh, they help us to find locations. Um, one of the uh, other difficulties that we run into is things that happened uh, on the fly. Someone was uh, giving, relating to me a, a story today about uh, a, a relative who uh, uh, is one of his great grandmothers who was uh, traveling in the west and uh, western part of the United States and uh, was in the uh, last stages of, of uh, pregnancy and had uh, was on a train and they stopped the train and let her off at a small town in the middle of nowhere and she had her baby right there in the middle of nowhere and then uh, stayed for a few days with a friendly uh, person there and then uh, traveled on again. Uh, so where babies are born are sometimes unexpected but in most cases when we're looking at locations, uh, the locations become uh, sometimes very difficult uh, one thing that I can say with relative assurance is that uh, with almost complete assurity, as a matter of fact, I can uh, and have been, the, the tools are now available and primarily online to locate nearly any location that's ever been put on a map in the history of, of uh, maps altogether. Um, there are databases with literally millions of place names and uh, historical place names. It's not unusual, as I have uh, done in the not too distant past, find a post office in Wisconsin that was only open for two weeks during the 1800s. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that are now available. Uh, secondly, we can judge distances between people and events. This is a reference to what I was just saying about uh, making a determination of whether or not uh, what you found about these individuals makes sense. Um, if, if every child in the family was born in one small parish in England, and then all of a sudden there's a child that's born 100 miles away, uh, you need to start asking why or how was this possible or how did this occur? And there better be a fairly good ex excuse or, or reason for it occurring, and uh, or you'll find uh, have to come to the conclusion that that child is not part of that family. Uh, a classic example from my own uh, ancestral lines is uh, my great great my great grandfather Henry Martin Tanner uh, for some time on the family search family tree was uh, the recipient of a uh, number of children who were born in England. Uh, my family uh, lived in northern Arizona had uh, were very um, let's just say the word poor, they weren't rich people, they didn't have the means for traveling, and they certainly did not send their uh, wives off to England to have babies. Uh, so this is not uh, something that's going to happen. And the maps help us visualize this as well as locate these to, uh, places and determine the distances. Um, very importantly, the maps also show us the jurisdictions to locate the record. The word jurisdiction has to do with 
uh, the entity that has responsibility for keeping the record. Uh, if you go through the jurisdictions, for example, the country is a jurisdiction and there are national records, uh, records that uh, are kept on a national basis. In the United States, we go down to state records and then we go down to county records and then we go down to local municipality records. Uh, sometimes there are townships and other designations and eventually we get down to individual records and the maps will show us how those uh, different areas changed and uh, were adapted over time. Uh, my great grandfather that lived in northern Arizona, if uh, the children who were born in 1877 when they arrived uh, were living in a county called Yavapai County and it was in the territory of Arizona. Uh, just a few years later, the county was uh, divided and they ended up in Apache County without having moved at all. They were now in a different county. And then later, even a, a few years later, uh, just before 1900, uh, the county was divided once again and they ended up in Navajo County. Originally, the town where they settled was called Allen's Camp. Uh, it was then changed, the name was changed to St. Joseph. And in the 1920s, this town was changed, name was changed again to Joseph City. So it, without ever having moved, they live in three different counties and three different cities. And without knowing that historical change, the historical changes there, uh, it may make things very difficult to, uh, to find the records, especially if you're looking for records in Navajo County when the record, when the event occurred in Apache County or in the Avapai County. Now we can use that exact same example all the way across the United States and into Europe and out throughout the world. Um, just a few minutes ago before I started this webinar, I had uh, a, a person ask me uh, about uh, finding German records. And I said, well, when did your people live in Germany? And they said in, in the 1840s. And I said, well, that's interesting because there wasn't anything, any country called Germany back then. Uh, it had to be some other country uh, designation and you probably need to know where well, a lot more specifically where those people lived. Um, this isn't helped by the way by the common uh, uh, designation on uh, United States census records beginning in 1850 uh, when they gave the, the country of origin of the person and if they spoke a Germanic language they, sent, they usually said that they came from Germany which really didn't mean anything back then because they were divided up into uh, sometimes various times dozens of different uh, little kingdoms and duchies and all sorts of, of, uh, of organizations. Each one of those had their own set of records and, and tracing those records is part of the genealogical research process. Last uh, is to correct misinformation. Um, some of the some of the uh, problems that we run into uh, in discovering and, and, and finding our ancestors has to do with uh, place names that have been improperly uh, written down, transmitted to us in some form. Um, one of my great grandfathers, actually a great great grandfather, uh, his own daughter wrote down that he was born in a place called uh, Mulvin. Uh, in England, excuse me, Murbin in England, M-U-R-B-I-N. Uh, we looked in, excuse me, in Northern Ireland. And it, we uh, looked for years for uh, what possibly that place could be and eventually found a record where he himself had written down where he was born. And he was born in a place called Mulvin in England, which was easily found uh, and confirmed that they lived in the area where we suspected that they lived. So, uh, you know, eventually the maps and the mapping information helps to uh, correct some of this misinformation. And you may have to use some imagination in, in determining whether or not uh, the place names uh, correspond to what uh, your ancestors have transmitted to you. Um, now we're going to get into the maps themselves. There are five major map types. First of those are general reference maps. We have topographical maps. We have thematic maps, uh, navigational maps, and cadastral maps. Um, I'm guessing that most of you uh, and those listening to this at some point in time 
uh, are, ref are familiar with general reference and topographical maps and probably would recognize a thematic map. Uh, unless you are, uh, you know, fly a plane or, or sail boats out on the ocean, you probably haven't uh, seen a lot of navigational maps. Uh, but the last one, cadastral maps, is probably a name that you're not familiar with. So we'll go through all of those different types of maps. First of all, we have general reference maps. This is probably what you're most familiar with. Uh, this is what you would get if you stopped at a rest stop and picked up a map uh, of a state or um, uh, whatever area of interest um, or got a map at some other visitor center or whatever or went out and purchased a, a book of maps of the United States or Canada or wherever you were visiting. Uh, these are general maps that show generally where things are located uh, on the, uh, in the country. And uh, some of them can be quite detailed. Of course, uh, they get down to um, the level of the of cities and streets and street maps and all of those things. These are the ones you're probably most familiar with. Now, this particular map comes from the nationalatlas.gov. And that is the national map of the United States. I'm, uh, you probably were not aware that we had a national map. Uh, we do. And uh, there are lots of different versions of the national map. They've put out uh, uh, this website, which is part of the uh, uh, USGS, uh, the um, United States Geological Survey. And they uh, put out all this information on all these maps. And we'll talk about them uh, uh, a number of times during the presentation here. Secondly, we have topo maps or topographical maps. A, a topographical map is a two-dimensional representation of the three-dimensional world. Uh, the little squiggly lines you see there are uh, survey lines that represent uh, places that are connected at the same altitude. So as those little squiggly lines get closer together, uh, the land is steeper. Uh, you can show cliffs and valleys and rivers and, and uh, canyons and things on, on these kinds of maps. And there happens to be a river running down through the middle of this particular uh, map example and uh, several uh, tributary streams running into it with uh, some hills on either side. Uh, once you get used to topographical maps, uh, you can kind of, uh, you can visualize exactly what the land looks like. If you've been doing, uh, as I have, uh, looking at topographical maps ever since you were a little kid, and that's a long, long time ago, uh, I can recognize, uh, I can look up at, this, at the uh, surroundings and look at the map and, and match the surroundings to the map. So they're very, very valuable for navigational on land for, for finding places. What they're really not so good at is trying to drive around in a, in, on a roads and vehicles because uh, these do show roads, but they're, they have a tendency to show roads in a way that doesn't necessarily indicate the condition of the road. And if you live out here in the western part of the United States, you have to be very careful to look at the, at the legend on the map, which tells, tells the way the road looks, is that uh, some of the, the uh, lines that show roads may turn out to be uh, rather challenging for any kind of anything but a four-wheel drive vehicle. Uh, a thematic map is one that conveys uh, information. This one shows uh, the uh, margin of victory uh, for George Bush over John Kerry for president and voter turnout. So you've got uh, uh, two different things. You have little circles showing you the, the age of the population that voted and uh, you sh it shows you uh, color-wise uh, the margin of victory depending on which state it was that uh, went for, for Bush or Kerry. Uh, you can find these that show everything from dairy products to uh, the age of people graduating from uh, universities. There's maps for almost any purpose and reason and an idea that, that can be conveyed visually uh, over, over a geographic area. The next type of maps are the ones I mentioned are the navigational maps. And uh, they're usually uh, very, very uh, if it's a, a navigational, oceanic navigational map such as this one, 
uh, you'll see there's a very little bit of information about the country uh, there in the, in the upper right hand corner. Uh, you've got from very, very detailed information on the coast and the coastal uh, cities and other uh, different types of rocks and obstacles that might be there. Uh, but the main feature of this map is this compass rose that's sitting here that shows you uh, uh, the directions of the uh, uh, for travel and for approach to various points uh, on the on the coastline. Um, so this is uh, limited value, of course, to um, genealogists, but uh, it's possible that you could be using this, especially if your ancestor was um, was someone who had a, a close relationship with the ocean, with the lake or an ocean. Last are cadastral maps, and that's kind of a kind of a weird word, but basically what it, uh, if you think of it in terms of a tax, of taxing, the government created these for two reasons. They either created them for military purposes or they uh, created them for taxing purposes. And um, what their, their object here was to show uh, the actual physical uh, arrangement of various things on the land. Uh, it's, it's related kind of remotely to topographical map, but it doesn't show uh, the contour lines. It doesn't show hills and valleys so much as it shows who owns the land. And so a cadastral map of uh, any area is extremely valuable for genealogical research because they are available, uh, they will be available during different time periods showing who owned various pieces of property. Um, you can confirm that your family did or did not live in an area by looking at a cadastral map uh, of that area. Some of the states in the United States that have these types of maps um, are uh, very, very heavy in the Midwest. So you have uh, practically the entire state of Iowa, Nebraska, uh, Kansas, and those states um, with extreme detail over many years, uh, publishing these kinds of maps every few years. And the collections are, are mostly digitized and mostly online. There's a huge number of maps uh, from the Library of Congress, but there is also uh, individual state collections for uh, this type of maps. So if you go onto Google and look for cadastral maps, you'll be surprised at the large number of, of, of available maps. Uh, one of the more valuable sets of cadastral maps out there um, are the Sanborn uh, insurance maps. Uh, these maps show uh, uh, the rate, insurance, insurance rates of property. There, there were over, beginning in the 1860s, they began drawing these maps regularly to show uh, what kinds of property there were and, and what the, t uh, the insurance rate would be. So the, the, all of the historic dwellings and, and out structures and everything are shown on these maps and they're told whether they're wood or brick or, or uh, whatever type of construction. And uh, so you can go back and, and, and find out uh, who owned and where, who, what was the identity of, of historic dwellings. And it's, they're interesting from the standpoint that in many of the towns, as you drive through the downtown section of for particularly smaller towns in the, in the United States, uh, you can find some of these buildings are still available. They're still there after 100 years or 150 years or even 200 years, of, although they won't show up on the map um, if they're older than 1862, obviously. that's The 1860s was about when these maps began to be made. But you can find those by looking for Sanborn, S-A-N-B-O-R-N maps. Um, at uh, Here in Utah, for example, they, uh, there's a rather uh, large collection of them at the University of Utah library. And uh, many of these are online and many are from, uh, uh, you'll even find uh, subscription websites that, that purport to have a lot of these maps available. Um, so this is a, a very profitable area for people to investigate with uh, and research in their area. Uh, it it kind of goes without saying that geographic maps present a curved surface on a flat map. Now, uh, I am assuming here that you are not one of the people who believe in a flat earth and that you do not think that NASA and the, and the uh, moon uh, visits were uh, 
a publicity stunt done in Hollywood. Uh, all of that, if, you, if that's where you are, uh, you're going to have a lot of difficulty trying to find your ancestors anyway. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, throughout the world's history of maps, uh, this has been the challenge. The challenge is to accurately show distances and relationships that on the uh, curved surface of the Earth uh, in a flat and on a flat map, on a two-dimensional two map. Um, all of these different ways of showing, uh, of trying to to show this uh, relationship, are called projections or map projections. And it's interesting because there are more than 60 different systems of map, prode map prode projections that are in use today. So you're going to see all sorts of different ways of representing the Earth. Uh, some uh, show relative sizes of the uh, areas. Uh, most of you are very much uh, probably familiar with the most common one, which is Mercator. It's the one you probably saw frequently in school on, the, on bulletin boards and things like this. Uh, or you're still looking at, and uh, you probably, if you're, if you've seen this map all your life, you probably think uh, Greenland is this humongous, huge continent that's practically as big as the entire country of Europe and everything else. Well, when you finally get to a globe and look at uh, what looks like on a globe, you you're always amazed at how small Greenland and some of the other northern countries are, comparatively. Uh, one that isn't uh, as quite as uh, misrepresented as Canada because Canada is really big. <laughs> okay. Um, and one thing you have to understand, of course, is that maps, all the maps, have a degree of distortion and error. Uh, all the topographical maps printed in the United States uh, at the bottom of the map actually tell you the uh, percentage of error and show you uh, the degrees of error that are, that are inherent in that particular map. Um, this comes about, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it comes about by the fact that uh, our methods of measuring distances and our me methods of determining uh, locations on the surface of the Earth uh, have increased in accuracy over time. And old in, in ancient times, we relied on relatively um, inaccurate methods. Uh, if you think about this for just a, for just a few minutes, you'll figure out what could happen. Um, if you uh, if you were off by one degree in, uh, in in taking a voyage across the ocean, you could miss your uh, intended location by uh, hundreds, if not a thousands, of miles. Uh, that depending on the distance you travel. So. You really need to be aware that that, that uh, distortion sometimes creates uh, uh, some very uh, uh, unique ways of looking at the world. Of course, in this old map, you have uh, all of the pro the uh, prevailing winds blowing from the edges, and uh, these little guys with red hair were uh, out there someplace on the other edge of the world, blowing around. And I don't think they're there anymore. I'm, I think they were just recruited for this particular map. We'll, we'll think about that. Here's the Mercator view, and you can see up in the northern part up there the the size of Greenland, which looks you know much larger than the continental than the uh, United States part of North America, um, and of course the southern uh, Australia down there is much smaller than uh, than New than Greenland, but it's actually the other way around. Greenland is really a lot smaller than than Australia, so you you get sort of a of a uh, squished towards the north kind of uh, view out of Mercator projections. Uh, next one, these are just some examples. I didn't go through all 60, so don't don't get worried. I'm not going to do 60 different projections. This is called the Cassini, and you can see here there's a little bit difference. And the, the, uh, here you can see uh, a more realistic size of Greenland, which is that white spot sort of near the North Pole there. And then the, the Antarctica is the big spot at the south. You can see how much smaller um, uh, Greenland appears than Australia, which is sort of floating off the edge of the Earth there. I think some of these maps contribute to the idea that the world is flat, but that's just uh, could be an opinion there. This is a kind of an interesting map. It's called the Dymaxion map. And uh, uh, this was F. Buckminster Fuller. 
uh, invented uh, this particular system of projection. And it's actually very accurate in, in preserving the relative sizes. Uh, just for a quick check, you look at Greenland, which is just off the coast of North America, and then down to the left, Australia. And you'll see how much smaller uh, Greenland is than Australia. Um, and the relative sizes of the continents are, are much more uh, accurately represented. This map can then be folded into a duo, uh, well, a shape. I won't try to say the word. And uh, it was interesting because I got one of these years ago and it's sitting on my desk for about 30 or 30 years or so. Uh, so this is the map I'm really most familiar with for some very strange reasons. Now, we need to get into the idea of latitude versus longitude. Um, this is something that, uh, these are one of these things that, that uh, people say, well, I can't ever remember the difference. And the answer is, well, that's why they invented computers and smartphones, because then all you have to do is look it up every time you have to, you have to worry about it. Uh, the important thing here is to understand that uh, there is a difference. Uh, the latitude is north and south of the equator and the longitude lines are the lines that run around the Earth in a clockwise, counterclockwise fashion and uh, begin at what's called the prime meridian. Um, it is no coincidence that the prime meridian goes through England because that's where they invented it and that's where they determined it. Uh, since that time, uh, there's been so many maps drawn that uh, it'd be probably even uh, politically impossible to redo it. Uh, but so zero is actually through uh, uh, northern Spain, uh, England, and the uh, western part of Africa. So uh, your your degrees north and south and your degrees east and west are either positive or negative depending on uh, which direction you go for uh, across the around the world. So if you're going west from the prime meridian, then the numbers are minus numbers. If you're going east, they're positive numbers. They meet together exactly opposite uh, the prime meridian on the other side of the world, which goes primarily through the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And then, uh, uh, then you can see the numbers. Uh, north and south, uh, minus is to the south, and, and north is, uh, is positive numbers. Uh, so those numbers are, are reflected in the um, in the what's called the coordinates, the geographic coordinates of any spot on the place on the face of the earth. The advantage of this particular system is that any geographic feature entirely independent of any political considerations, any government claims or anything else, can be identified with certainty. So ultimately. Um, we would be talking about the, the geographic location of any of any particular place on the face of the earth. Uh, there has been some movement in the past in the gene, in the genealogical community to incorporate uh, latitude and longitude into uh, the place description. And actually, there are some programs out there that uh, will allow you to put in the latitude and longitude and uh, and define that particular point uh, with very with very be very particular about the uh, point that you're talking about. Okay, well let's move on here. What did I just do? I got myself out of a. There we go. Um, now, so if we looked at the at a map of the flat map of the world instead of a, a visual three dimensional representation, you'll see the the latitude and longitude lines moving across the surface of the Earth. And you'll see the numbers on those nines at the bottom of the page that show uh, which direction you're, you're going in uh, and what, what those lines are. Uh, so I interesting thing about this is that it shows relative distances north and south from the equator and from the, the poles. Uh, so it's always been interesting to me that England uh, is, is uh, on the same uh, latitude as uh, northern Canada. Uh, and so if you thought about it for a minute, and England's this, you know, lovely green place with lots of rain and sort of mild winters, and and you think that uh, if you just went a little bit further west, you'd end up in the middle of the tundra in northern Canada, up close, near, up close to the 
to the uh, uh, Arctic Circle. Uh, and it's always surprising to me how many of the uh, European countries are, are almost into the Arctic Circle and still inhabitable, whereas in America, uh, it's very, very uh, unusual for people to live that far north because of the, the differences in the weather patterns. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing to, to contemplate. Also, you'll notice that there's very little land except for Antarctica uh, that is very far south. Uh, only the tip of South America and, and uh, relatively uh, parts of New Zealand and uh, uh, perhaps you might consider Africa. But most of the countries in, uh, in, uh, in the world lie at, along the equator or in the northern hemisphere. So these geographic coordinates come out in a matter of degrees, minutes, and seconds. And you can think of those, uh, uh, this is getting harder and harder to visualize as our children grow up and are, have never seen what we now call analog clocks uh, with hands that move around in a circle. And uh, I really, I have some of the younger children that I've talked to recently who, who do not know how to tell time and have never had uh, anybody explain to them uh, how, the, how a clock works. Um, but uh, that's basically the degrees, minutes, and seconds. That's uh, uh, looking at the Earth as if it were a clock, and you're putting it together with 60 degrees, uh, 360 degrees, excuse me, circle, and then dividing that into minutes uh, and into seconds. Um, in, in the opposite of that, we have what are called decimal coordinates, and these are simply numbers that are assigned uh, based on base 10, uh, like the metric system, and uh, makes our lives a lot easier. So here we are, the red spot here on that uh, um, map in front of you uh, represents uh, the library here in Provo, and our uh, decimal coordinates uh, come out to be 40.265169 minus 111.647377. Now that's close enough to put that exactly there within just a couple of feet. So that is exactly where we are. And if I were to do that in minutes and uh, degrees and minutes and seconds, it would come out 40 degrees, 14 minutes, 57.4944 seconds, and then minus 111.3850. 5314. So these are uh, these are the exactly the same place in those two different methods of, of measuring. Now, of course, today we're all sort of uh, uh, privileged in a sense because nobody has ever been able to see this previously. Uh, we have what are called satellite views, literally uh, satellites orbiting the Earth that have high, very high resolution cameras. Uh, in fact, uh, I've seen some demonstrations of the resolution, and they could actually, you hear rumors of this, and you'd think it was an urban legend that you could read a newspaper from space. Uh, believe it, it I've, I've seen it actually uh, have uh, that degree of, uh, of being able to see something. In fact, I've seen satellite views where you could see somebody jumping up and down in a parking lot. And actually see them jumping up and down with a movie that was taken from space. So um, it, it's not not within uh, not in science fiction uh, or within the realm. Uh, the satellite views that we're most usually uh, con accustomed with come with uh, mapping programs like Google's Maps or or Apple Maps or uh, any of the uh, different companies that have put out their different mapping. Bing, I think, have its its own mapping program from Microsoft. Um, and they're, but they're all based on, uh, on the, uh, the concept that we can take uh, physical pictures uh, that can be updated from time to time of uh, the location. This is a, a satellite view of the Brigham Young University campus and the surrounding area in Provo, Utah. And we can zoom in to see details. Now I'm going to go back and see over there at the, uh, if you look very closely, uh, where the kind of light colored uh, brown tape is where the canyon begins, that's called Rock Canyon. And there is a parking lot at the, uh, at the edge of that canyon. You can see that green arrow come in and point to the, 
parking lot. Now I'm going to zoom in on it. You can see the cars parked in that parking lot. Um, this is uh, the uh, um, this is basically the the resolution. When I we used to show this a few years ago, most people would go ooh and ah because very few people had realized that uh, that this kind of resolution was possible. I used to tell people to be careful not to go out in the backyard without your clothes on because you never knew if a satellite was coming on taking pictures of you and you'd be preserved forever uh, standing out there. But anyway, uh, the question is, can you go in further? And the answer is, uh, well, there are some uh, privacy and uh, government uh, security issues, and uh, they do stop. But uh, the answer is yes, uh, they can go in until they could read the license plates on those cars. Um, so that's uh, basically the, the type of detail that we can now see from our maps. Now, the advantage to genealogists that gives us is that we have the ability now to really go in and identify down to the little lot, down to the house of, the peop of where the people lived uh, that we are, uh, are researching. Um, so the GPS coordinates, uh, the geographic positioning system coordinates, uh, are created by the position of various satellites as they go around the Earth. Uh, we have what are called geosynchronous satellites that uh, appear to be stationary. They, they travel around the Earth at exactly the same speed that the Earth rotates, so the satellite appears to stay in one position over the surface of the Earth all the time. And uh, by doing that, they become like beacons that can be used to determine the exact location of any place on the face of the Earth. Now, one of the things that I used to get involved in as an attorney, as I practiced law, was uh, boundary disputes uh, over property. And so we were always out getting surveyors to survey the property. Uh, over the years, over the nearly 40 years that I practiced law, uh, the accuracy of these surveyors increased incredibly. Uh, when we started, we were lucky if the surveyors would agree within 10 or 15 feet of each other. When we were through, uh, we were talking about surveyors who could divide a six-inch brick wall uh, with their measurements. So um, this has become an extremely accurate way of representing positions on the earth and it's it's a marvelous tool for locating our ancestors because we can hear visually and actually track them across the face of the earth by identifying uh, the locations where the where different events occurred now the advantages that we have from uh, having this kind of technology is that we can find a route now everybody uh, well I'm not say everybody's not everybody but um, those of us who uh, have smartphones or GPS devices are now uh, well into the to the possibility of uh, telling uh, the program where you want to go and having it either draw a line on a map and show you where you can go or uh, or even giving you uh, uh, spoken directions on how to get there. Um, we had kind of an unfortunate experience this past weekend up in the mountains of Utah uh, we didn't bother to turn on our GPS and ended up on the wrong dirt, on the wrong road, uh, and spent an extra hour or two wandering around in the mountains before we got home. Uh, it was simple to get home because when we realized we we had gone to the wrong or taken a wrong turn, we pulled out the GPS and turned it on, and it told us how to get home. Unfortunately, it took a while to get there, but uh, that's uh, you know this is the technology that we have, and it can be adapted and used. By, um, by a lot of different uh, people for a lot of different purposes, and particularly by genealogists. And one of the, the, one of the most uh, useful t things here is to measure the distance between two locations. Let's say that uh, uh, you have ancestors, and I'm going to keep giving examples in England, but let's say you have an ancestor who lives in Sussex, and you have another ancestor that lives in Lancashire, supposedly. And they're supposed to be in the same family, so what you but you have no idea the difference between those two points. Um, and so basically, let's say that uh, uh, what you do is you put in the place that uh, uh, 
uh, you're you're trying to uh, say the the event occurred, and uh, the other place, the place where another event was supposed to have occurred, and it gives you the distance between those and shows you the route and tells you how long it would take to walk that far or to drive that far. Okay, well that kind of information tells you the relative believability of those two to the two different locations that have given to you on the uh, by your your research uh, it, based on the time period involved. So if they were 100 miles apart in, in 1980, uh, that wouldn't be much of a concern. If they were 100 miles apart in 1780, you might begin to believe that those people probably uh, were not the same family and, and the two events were not connected by any reason. Uh, one of the other factors that helps in making this determination in England is, uh, for example, and also in the United States, is to is to look at the census records, if that's possible, or other records uh, that might tell you what uh, occupation that your ancestor had. If your ancestor was a, a royal family, it may be possible that all of these different locations were just different uh, homes or manors where they lived and they just traveled regularly between those locations. On the other hand, if, you're, if your ancestor was an agricultural laborer or serf, uh, probably had no, no physical or economic way to travel more than just a few miles from uh, where they lived and died. So uh, these are all factors that help us, and the maps give us a very quick view. This is Google Maps, and Putting this information into Google Maps is a, is a quick way to determine uh, the reasonableness of any, any genealogical claim uh, that says that two events occurred in, the, in different locations. Um, so it, it could happen, but uh, most of the time, uh, if, the, if the distance is too far and the, and the time period is too far, too remote in the past, then that erase, raises an almost instantaneous question of believability. Okay, um, this is a map view. Uh, in other words, it takes out all the all the satellite information and shows you just roads and and uh, towns and distances and a few other uh, physical features. In this case, you're getting national forests and and lakes and and other government property out there. Now the scale of a map is the ratio of the distance on the map to a corresponding distance on the ground. Uh, and it's, this, the concept is complicated by the curvature of the earth, which forces the scale to vary across a map. Now that sounds what it sounds really interesting. What it means to the genealogist is that the distances that you measure on a map may not be uh, exact uh, when you try to put them onto the ground. Uh, they're going to be approximate in some cases. Uh, the difference um, with, the, with the satellite views is that the distances are measured by uh, the geographic coordinates and the time it takes to travel the distance uh, at an average speed. And so they're much more accurate because they are measuring them specifically on the curved surface, not uh, an independent. They have programs that calculate those, those distances. So, the distances shown on Google Maps, for example, uh, will be much more accurate uh, in, in, in a lot of cases than that shown on a topographical map. So if we were to show that on a map with a scale, you'd see that, uh, the, that the scaling on the map goes way off, uh, the, uh, can, is distorted at the top, towards the top of the map here, and that shows you a kind of from the scale standpoint, why Greenland looks huge compared to Australia uh, on uh, the Mercator projection type maps. Now there are three kinds of maps uh, generally that we talk about. Uh, the two that are most prominent are small scale maps. That means a large area with little detail. And so one to a million feet or smaller. So a smaller scale. So this is the confusing part of working with maps because small scale equals large area. The smaller the scale, meaning the, the greater the ratio, uh, the uh, larger the area that's shown. Uh, this is the only way that we can show 
uh, the entire world map uh, at one time. Otherwise, it would take a huge uh, area of space to, uh, to create the map at a, at a larger scale. Um, a medium scale map is a map that goes uh, that's larger than uh, it's a larger scale than one to a million, but smaller than one to seventy-five thousand. There's a little bit more detail here. These are the ones that are generally used to show states and countries and uh, cities and other parts of the world uh, in their relationship. And then we have uh, large-scale maps. Uh, scales of 75,000 or larger with even more detail and we can get down to maps that show neighborhoods or even you know very small areas of towns or or farms individual farms and cities so these are the the, the large scale maps um, so the larger the scale the smaller the area the smaller the scale the larger the area kind of a reverse relationship there so even on this map, for example, if we look in and zoomed in on this particular map, we'd see that uh, that that we can we can see down to uh, the building level uh, on this particular map of Berlin. This is from 1929. Uh, now topographical maps uh, also come in different scales so you can judge them by the scale by the amount of detail and the type of map is shown up here this is a 1 to 250,000 means one one measurement one unit of measurement on the on the uh, the ground is represented by uh, the, excuse me the other way around one unit of measurement on the map is represented by 250,000 units on the ground so if it was one inch on the map, it would be uh, 250,000 inches on the ground. Down here in the lower part of a topographical map, you have the legend. This tells you all the different symbols and things that are on that map. Now, the legends on a topographical map itself are seldom as detailed as the entire uh, catalog or dictionary of these particular symbols. And there are books and uh, websites that show all the different symbols used on topographical maps uh, over the years. Uh, down here at the bottom of the topographical map is the scale. And um, using a, a, a ruler or, or measuring device, you can then um, calculate distances uh, because uh, the length of those bars uh, is shown in miles. So uh, the first, there are increments of one mile and five miles and 10 miles and 15 and 20 miles. And then it's also translated into kilometers and into nautical miles. So these are, uh, and the important thing here is they also tell you the contour interval on this particular map, it's 200 feet. That means for every line, if between those uh, lines that are drawn on the topographical map, uh, there are 200 feet difference. So if you're climbing a hill and you see a bunch of those lines and you've got to go through 10 lines, then you've got to go through 2,000 feet of, prop, of, of distance. So it's kind of an interesting way to see um, uh, the altitude changes and things of a map. So if you can, eventually, if you're used to these, you can translate this all in your head and it gives you a pretty good accurate way of looking at the land. Uh, down here we have some more explanations. This one tells you how how uh, where these maps are located in relation to other maps. Uh, it also gives you uh, the how the sections and townships are set up. This map happens to be of Salt Lake City, Utah, and um, it is uh, uh, they've got different explanations of how it all fits together. Here's a here's a, a a graph of the common map scales. You can see that there's uh, very very large scale and very small scale maps, uh, depending on the the type of things that it wants to how much information and what size of the area uh, wants to be shown. Here's a one to twenty five thousand topographical map. 
of uh, the southern part of, of uh, Salt Lake. Now, the important thing about this map is the grid and magnetic north declination. Um, at the center of the map sheet, then this, if you put a dot at the center of the map sheet and you were standing there with a compass, the compass would point towards MN, magnetic north. The north star would be there where that star is, and geographic north, or the map north on the map, would be that geographic. So in other words, if you're if you are trying to navigate on a topographical map uh, and you're using a compass, then you better know the correction, uh, the difference in degrees, because it's off by 13 and a half degrees from the uh, from true north. So if you're if you think you're going north when you have your compass lined up with the north south lines on the map, uh, you're exactly off that far. And as you launch yourself out following the compass, you're going to be off, off your uh, degrees. You line your compass up with the magnetic north and then have the map, north and south lines on the map, uh, north, uh, lined up with the geographic north. Okay. And then we have, I mentioned all of the different topographical symbols, and there's uh, um, all sorts of online and book uh, sec uh, lists of all these different signal, uh, symbols and how they were used to represent physical features on the face of the Earth. Uh, a couple of places where you can get to look at maps uh, that are um, very, very helpful. This is one uh, portal. It's called Old Maps Online. And uh, they have tens of thousands of maps uh, linked here. Uh, how this particular program works is that it shows a, uh, a geographic representation of the Earth. Uh, you simply have a tool in the upper left-hand corner where you can draw rectangles. Every time you draw a rectangle on any part of the Earth's surface, uh, then it will show you all of the historical maps that are available for that location on the right-hand side of the map. Uh, this is a, a tremendous uh, tool for finding uh, old maps of various areas and finding out what the places were called in the old days. Um, and uh, it's also a, a, a very interesting to see how the maps have changed over time. Uh, this is a, a, anyone who likes maps at all, this is sort of the uh, uh, ultimate place to go to find every, maps of every part of the whole world. So these maps on the right correspond to the rectangle that's drawn uh, on the screen. And then that's actually a scrolling list of there are usually hundreds of maps for any geographical area that you draw. So this is one of the maps uh, that uh, of England that uh, I selected out of those tens of thousands of maps. Uh, some of them are very high resolution. You can zoom in and see all of the names of all the places. Now I mentioned the national map. Um, this is uh, the uh, USGS map. Uh, part of that is what's called the United States Board on Geographic Names. And this particular uh, organization began in 1890 to catalog all the geographic features in the world, period. Uh, end of story. There are millions and millions of places in this database and you can go search uh, by, by place name. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have a, a town called Buckeye Flat and you go into the United States, it'll tell you every location in the United States that was called Buckeye Flat. Um, it's things like that that uh, are helpful in finding. It also works internationally in conjunction with a lot of other websites. Uh, you do a search uh, by a feature name, and that uh, will give you the exact coordinates of that search. I, I, I guess I could kind of conclude this by saying that the map resources online are, are overwhelmingly ex extensive. Um, we often talk about, in genealogical uh, community, we say, well, all the records haven't been digitized yet. My answer back is, yeah, but all the maps have been. 
uh, literally not every map that ever existed has been digitized, but the number of maps that cover the Earth are into the tens of not hundreds of thousands of digitized maps online. Plus we have the satellite views that actually give us down to the house level of almost any location on the face of the Earth. So we're, we're really into, um, into an area where you have um, just almost unlimited resources to determine the actual uh, location of a place. The point here is to keep learning. Uh, maps are somewhat complicated, but having a little bit of knowledge about how they work and, and what types of maps there are will, will uh, give you a lot of benefits in your genealogical research. So thanks for watching and uh, remind you that uh, uh, this is a uh, sponsored, these presentations are sponsored by the BYU Family History Library and uh, the, the videos of these presentations are available on the BYU Family History Library web site as well as the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and please take the time to subscribe. Thank you very much, James, for the wonderful webinar. And we'd like to thank those that participated in our poll and in the webinar. We hope to see you next time. Thanks.